All right, we continue in the book of Judges. We are in uh, chapter 21, the last chapter of the book. Uh, kind of just to remind us where we were in chapter 20. Uh, we have the issue with the people of Gibeah who took the Levite's concubine, abused her to the point where they killed her. And you remember he cut her body up and sent all 12 pieces to the 12 tribes of Israel. And they came together and there was the battle that ensued against, uh, against not only uh, the people of Gibeah, but the whole tribe of Benjamin, uh, because there was some conflict and issues that were they were dealing with. That they Somehow they, the children of Benjamin decided they would fight rather than allow what the original plan was to just get those people who were responsible for the crime and punish them, and it turned into a whole civil war. And now that civil war is over, the tribes of Israel have been victorious over Benjamin, and then there are some issues that come from that that we'll deal with here in chapter in chapter 21. And it starts, now the men of Israel had sworn an oath at Mizpah, saying, none of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a wife. Then the people came to the house of God and remained there before God till evening. They lifted up their voices and wept bitterly and said, O Lord God of Israel, why has this come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel? Just reading that on the surface, is there something kind of ironic about that statement? That last one there in verse, uh, uh, verse 3, that there's one tribe missing in Israel? Okay, they didn't think it through. <laughs> and again, I don't know that the, the author of the book of Judges is trying to, to make a kind of a sarcastic point here. Why is it that there's a tribe missing in Israel when you guys just killed them all? Uh, you decided to go to war with them rather than just the men of, of, of there and they've decided to fight. That's why it happened. So they, I think they know why it happened. But maybe like Janelle said, these are the unintended consequences. They didn't think this through. What's this going to mean if we destroy one of our tribes? We are no longer the 12 tribes of Israel. We are the 11 tribes of Israel. And that was something that maybe came home to them, if you will, after they had done all of this. And what, what does that mean for us? We've got uh, our family who is no longer, who's no longer with us. And they swore this oath that we're not going to give our daughters to Benjamin's uh, the remaining Benjamites as wives, which is, in theory, what's going to that do for the remaining people of Benjamin? They're going to disappear, or they're going to be forced to intermarry with other people in order to survive as a tribe, and that's kind of why this process <coughs> got started in the first place, of them not doing what God had told them uh, to do. So they lifted their voices, they wept bitterly, at least they're before the house of God, and they're praying to God and talking to God about this, which is something they haven't always done. Uh, some commentaries on this, just that I found interesting in, in my preparation. Uh, Adam Clark, in his commentary, said, why has this come to pass? This was a very impertinent question. They knew well enough how it came to pass. It was right that the men of Gibeah should be punished, but they carried their revenge too far. And uh, so that was again his take on that particular that particular idea. So it was on the next morning that the people rose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And the children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who did not come up with the assembly of the Lord? For they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the Lord at the Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin their brother and said, One tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for wives for those who remain, seeing we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? And so again, this, uh, their thought process just keeps going and it gets their predicament gets worse because they made this oath, which probably in many of your Bibles or many of the commentators will say it was a foolish oath for them to make. Uh, and so as a result of that, they made this oath and they're going to keep that oath, which Again, I find interesting, they made this oath, so we're going to keep this oath. And yet all the time they've been worshiping the Baals, and they, they forgot their oath they made to God. They didn't seem to keep that, but now they're sticking with this particular oath. Go ahead, Dave. I, mean, I, I kind of want to say the men of Israel swore the oath. Mm -hmm. Is that like saying that God says, I have a form of government that I have now, but I support everything my government supports? Was there not anybody in the nation? 
<laughs> well, I don't, I don't know because it doesn't say all it says that they made that oath. And, and why they made it, uh, the, again, I think maybe we can say it was kind of a, 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 an oath that was made that was not thought through completely as to what that would mean. And the rest of the chapter is going to be them trying to uphold that oath, but at the same time, save what's left of the tribe of the tribe of Benjamin. Well, I, just, I guess where I'm going, though, it seems like as we read through that their sources are getting wise to the fact that somebody could betray us. Uh, in other words, they're getting wise from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and we're going to talk about where they decide to get those wives from, which is, like you say, it's a group of people who didn't come to the battle, so they weren't there to make that oath. Yeah. And, and, and again, again, they didn't, didn't seem to think this through very well to get to the point where they are there. Uh, and in fact, there no one had come from the camp of Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent out there 12,000 of their most valiant men and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. And this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male and every woman who has known a man intimately. Okay, so everybody, but then they've set the stage for the next few verses. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately, and they brought them to the camp of Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. And then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin, who were at the Rock of Rimmon. And you remember there was a group that hid out at the Rock of Rimmon for about four months there before things uh, turned south for them, uh, and announced peace to them. So Benjamin came back at the time, and they gave the women whom they had saved alive to the women of the women of Jabesh Gilead, and yet they had not found enough for them. You remember how many went to the Rock of Rimmon? 600 and now they've got 400 wives so they still got 200 guys who are, are left out in the cold so to speak and the people grieve for benjamin because the lord had made a void in the tribes of israel and so again this problem is just multiplying so they've taken these 400 uh, virgins they're going to bury them off to the benjamites so that at least the stock of benjamin continues on through the tribe of israel rather than the marrying uh, outside of the faith and the elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for wives for those who remain, since the women of Benjamin have been destroyed? And they said, There must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, that a tribe may not be destroyed from Israel. However, we cannot give them wives from our daughters, for the children of Israel had sworn an oath, saying, Cursed be the one who gives a wife to Benjamin. So again, there's that oath that all of a sudden they're, they're hanging on to with their dear life, and they're not going to violate that oath. Then they said, Hmm, let's think about this. In fact, there's a yearly feast of the Lord in Shiloh, which is north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Labona. Therefore, they instructed the children of Benjamin, saying, Go lie and wait in the vineyards and watch. And just when the daughters of Shiloh came out to perform their dances, when they come out from the vineyards and every man catch a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh, then go to the land uh, of Benjamin. And so now what are they contemplating? Kidnapping. Okay, uh, so <laughs> we're going to keep our oath, but we're going to kidnap people in order to keep that oath. And so again, uh, we look back and shake our heads, and, and uh, again, one of the things we need to be very careful about is we condemn them for what they did, uh, for the silly mistakes that they made, and yet you look, Kevin looks at his life, and how many silly mistakes do I make, and silly choices and things do I make? And so we need to be careful about not being too critical of them, uh, but so they decide this is how we're going to get the, the next 200. So these dancers at Shiloh, not sure where this particular tradition came from. Uh, most of the, the theologians and commentators suggest that it may be a reenactment of what happened in Exodus 15 and verse 20. Uh, then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered and said, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. And so maybe that's where it came from. We don't know for sure, but uh, at least there was this seemingly well-known, well-practiced event where these women come out and dance. Uh, 
uh, as, as a result of, of something. And so that could be the answer to where that, that particular tradition came from. Then it shall be when their fathers or their brothers come to us to complain. Now, why would they do that? You just kidnap 200 of our, our dollars. What's up with that? What's wrong with that? When they come out to complain and they work us all out, be kind to them for our sakes, because we did not take a wife for any of them in the war. For it is not as though you have given the women to them at this time, making yourself guilty of your oath. That was their reasoning process. We all made an oath that we wouldn't give wives. You're abiding by that oath. But by us coming and stealing the women and giving them to her, then that satisfies the oath. Uh, and so, again, in my mind, and maybe you feel differently, in my mind, that seems like kind of convoluted reasoning as to justify what they're doing. And uh, but that's, that's the story that they came up with and what they were sticking with. And the children of Benjamin did so. They took enough wives for their number from those who danced who they, whom they caught. Because, again, Benjamin's the one actually doing the, the catching. It wasn't the other tribes of Israel. So, well, Benjamin did it. We didn't do it. We, we upheld our oath. And in order for this to happen, so Benjamin's not destroyed, you've upheld your oath, but this is a good thing for you to do. And uh, the children of Benjamin did so. They took enough wives for their numbers from those who danced, whom they caught. Then they went and returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the cities and dwelt in them. So the children of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his own tribe and family, and they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And so that kind of wraps up everything. That's how the story comes to an end, so to speak, uh, of how they got through all of this, the, the oath that they made that they probably shouldn't have, the, the vengeance they took that maybe they shouldn't have, the, the whole sordid story is just, when you start carving up a woman's body in 12 pieces, you know it can't get any better from there. And that's kind of what happened with, with all of this particular story. Uh, a few more quotes. Uh, quotes. Quotes. Go ahead, Marcia. I wonder what the time frame is, because it says they rebuilt the city. Mm -hmm. I wonder what that time frame is. Yeah, and we don't know, because we're not given a, a chronology of how that happened. You know, how long did it take to rebuild cities? Well... How long does it take to fix a pothole in Colorado Springs? You know, it's, it, yeah, it, it takes a while in order for that to in order for that to get done. And so that we're again, and we got to remember, Judges was written after all of these events, and so it was written telling those events. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't give us a chronology of how long how long that took. Uh, so we're kind of left with with that question unanswerable, really. Um, Kiel and Delich. Uh, who, uh, if you want a good commentary on the Old Testament, they do a really good job. If you want to read 3,000 words for every paragraph in the Old Testament, they, they're quite wordy, but uh, a lot of good information in there. Uh, but they said the oath itself was an act of rashness in which there was not only an utter denial of brotherly love, but the bounds of justice were broken through. And so uh, I think they make a good point uh, with that particular idea. Uh, Matthew Henry. Uh, again, he's one of those guys who uses a lot of words to talk about things, and so there's a lot to read. He said, great care must be taken in the government of our zeal. Let that which seems supernatural in its cause prove unnatural in its effects. In other words, they were on fire, we're going to save Benjamin, and with the zeal, we're saving Israel. And yet, Matthew Henry says, maybe that zeal produced unnatural results uh, in trying to do what you needed to fix, but you guys are the ones who made the problem in the first place. And so that's kind of his take on that. Uh, and again, he says uh, a little bit later, men are commonly more zealous to support their own authority than God's. And so they're, they've decided this is how it ought to be. We've made this decision. We're going to support that decision in any way we can. Uh, and again, all the while, their following of God's will has been lacking in, in, so, many, in so many ways. Uh, Robert A. Watson in, from the Expositor's Bible says, blindly attempting to do right, we do evil. And again, having done the evil, we blindly strive to remedy it by doing more. And that kind of seems to be the, the issue. I think he's hit the nail on the head of this whole story uh, of what was going on here, what was happening, and, and how it was being dealt with. And then we get to the end. And again, we said this 
author of Judges could have written this one verse, put it in a letter, sent it to everybody, and it would have explained everything that had happened in Israel uh, from the time the book of Judges began till the time the book of Judges ended, and even, I'm sure, lasted long beyond that uh, in, in, in time, because they, Israel didn't just automatically become the righteous holy nation they should have been after the book of Judges was over because we've got the issue with the king and all of that that goes on. So it's not like this fixed the problem. Uh, this is the summary of the problem. In those days, there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And you can see the issue with that, can't you? Because if I were to pick, let's say, oh, I, I can't even think of a good example. Uh, Let's do something silly. Just real Go ahead, go ahead. <coughs> the lesson here for us is when we start making the rules and disregarding God's mm -hmm. rules, that's when we get in trouble. Yeah. yeah. We see that with uh, like our Wednesday night study mm -hmm. where they were started making creeds and changes and what have you, and all the bad results that took came about from that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, when we do it our way. It always ends in trouble when we do it God's way. It always ends in victory. And that's that seems to be the, the message here that, that we need to understand. Uh, go ahead, Dave. You know, one commentator that I read, I thought had a lot of merit, said modern followers of God can make the same mistake as they would put the interest of the whole nation before the interest of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. It's important for Christians to remember that they are citizens. Human nature is human nature, and it's an impulse that we can uh, make rash vows, rash oaths, do rash things, and even today there are people who would, who would be otherwise uh, well respected who have gotten themselves into bad situations because of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and. Again, real silly. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry, I didn't mean to sidetrack. That's all right. But you just said we, and I mean specifically you and I, have a bad habit of looking to the Bible to try to support what we already mm -hmm. believe instead of going to find out what God wants and then adjust our <clears throat> thinking accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Bob's right in that. And, uh, we use the Bible to proof text what I've already decided is right. And again, that's the issue here. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own sight. So I made up my mind, this is the way it's going to be. And I'm going to figure out how to use God's word to make that happen. And if you don't, what am I going to do? Well, look at Benjamin. That's what's going to happen uh, if, if we decide to do it our own way. And we can pick... Any, any, just pick a topic, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But let's say we float a question here and we'll use a silly example. We're about to remodel the auditorium and we're gonna have new carpet color, okay? And this is a silly illustration, I understand that. But if we were to poll everybody in this room this morning about what color that carpet must be, and hopefully none of us are that invested in that, I know I'm not. I, I, you know, I was in on a few of the meetings and it was like, what do you think? And I'm thinking, hey, these ladies know more about that than I do, so let them. But let's say you get invested in that for some reason. But you get invested that this carpet in this auditorium needs to be whatever color it is, it's your favorite color. And you feel so strongly about that that any other color won't do. So what do we tend to do in that situation? What would, let's say that I picked, I don't know, robin egg blue. I don't know why that popped into my head, but robin egg blue. That's the color. That's the color. That's going to look best in here. It's going to be the most perfect color in here. It's the best that there ever has been and ever will be, and that's what we need to do. What do I tend to do then when somebody comes up and says, ah, I think taupe would be better. Don't even know what taupe is. Or brown would be better. Or green would be better. What's the human, typical human reaction to that? Uh, yeah, no, 
my choice is better than your choice. And it just goes from there. And then I get my righteous indignation going because I know that I'm right and you're wrong. And it just, it snowballs into a fuss over what color of carpet is gonna be in the auditorium. And again, silly illustration, I know that. But we, I think we can all see how that, that can work. And there's no give and take because I have drawn the line in the sand and dared you to cross it. And when that happens, no good ever comes from that. And especially when it's Kevin's opinion being elevated over everything else. That's where problems begin. And so that's, to me, that's part of the issue here. Flo and then Dave. Yeah, that's why sometimes I, I don't agree with Dick and Reed because Dick and Reed is just a book. Yeah. When, when you eat it at one of the corporate levels and you ask them the whole 100,000 employees, what do you think? Mm -hmm. You know, 20,000 answers. So that's my comment. I would like to go back to that scripture there. When I look at that and read that, and what they were doing, it's like Dave said, human nature sometimes. We look at things, if I do something wrong, and in my eyes it's okay, then it's okay. Yeah. By the eye, that's how I do my view of that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we live that way. But if what I do, even if I do wrong, if it's in my eyes okay, it must be okay. Mm -hmm. But it's still a sin or it's still wrong. And we, like Lynn said, we kind of not trust God in those things and we want to make our own our own rules and our mm -hmm. own regulations. Yeah, exactly. And yet Jesus said, the first shall be last. And the last shall be first. All right, Dave, and then Elwin, and then Bill. Well, years ago, I, when I was teaching a class, I got confronted by someone because I wasn't meeting the team meeting rules. Mm -hmm. I explained to them. I mean, I got confronted several times. I explained to them over and over and over that, that uh, it's a matter of preference. That, that I, based on my own research, I like this person better. And they left. And that's, that's the issue, isn't it? Uh, and I don't have an answer for this. Where do you draw that line? And, and uh, I'm thankful that that's why we have elders. That's why we pay them so much to do what they do. So <laughs> they, can, <laughs> they can make those decisions. But it, it's, it's, you know, again, it's human nature. And it, uh, we tend to dig in when we think we're right. And Israel had dug in doing the things the way they wanted to. In spite of everything that's happened in the book of Judges, that's the, the final statement about what was going on. Ellen, you were next to me. Yes, and the biggest problem right now in the church is instability issues. Okay. That's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. The Richland Hills Church of Christ in Texas. Mm -hmm. With the elders, they spent a couple of years doing, you know, dealing with this. Mm -hmm. All the other local churches were begging them, please don't do this. And there was this big battle. It just turned into a battle yeah. right now. And once they did it, it's like everybody else, avoid them, mm -hmm. put them aside. Yeah. There's Christians in that building. Mm -hmm. So who's responsible? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Bill? I would just mention, on the subject of carpet, this mm -hmm. used to be orange carpet. And I don't know how we got to orange carpet. Okay. But I was orange carpet. Mm -hmm. Greg, was Grady involved in that decision making process? <laughs> <laughs> but the point I want to make is if you look back at what happened, the people in uh, Gibeah were clearly evil and wrong. Mm -hmm. But when it was called to the attention of Benjamin, Benjamin did not correct the wrong. Right. They went in defense of the evil. Mm -hmm. So that was really every man doing what he thought was right, then led to other people coalescing to say, well, whether it's right or wrong, we're going to support them because they're from the Benjamites, mm -hmm. which was one of the catalysts for this whole catastrophe. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, everybody drew the line in the sand, and once that line was drawn, we see the end result of that. Didn't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they figured it out themselves. And yet, and 
you hear at the end, they're before the house of God at Shiloh and building altars and doing that stuff. What would have happened had they done that in the very beginning? Every time when the issues came up, if they'd gone to God and said, what do we do? And then done what God told them to do, we wouldn't have the book of Judges. That would be the end of this discussion. Unfortunately, it's not what happened. Dave? Yeah, I asked a question. You can ask, I can't answer whether there was anyone in the nation of Israel that said, listen, hold on a minute, let's stop. Uh, probably, who knows? But, you know, in Exodus 10 chapter, while God was giving the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, one of the things, one of the lesser commandments was, do not follow the crowd in doing evil. Mm -hmm. That's a point here is somebody somewhere should have raised the finger and said, wait a minute, let's let's take a step back and look at the scene. You know, you know what so you know we, we are so easily again as human nature, we are so easily swayed into following the crowd and doing evil. I mean, World War II occurred because somebody, a majority of people followed the crowd and doing Exactly. Think, think first and not just think, okay, what does Kevin think about this? But that doesn't matter. What does God say about that? What can we get from Scripture that gives us guidance in whatever decision we're about to make, whatever we're about to do, whatever we're about to contemplate? What does God's Word say about that? And, and start there. And the, out, the chances of a good outcome are much better when you start there than when you start with Kevin's idea. Because Kevin's idea is sometimes, even when I look back at them, I think, what were you thinking? And God's made a way for us to, to know his will and his word, and that's where we need to start with everything. Uh, go ahead, Denta. One thing that, you know, God said, I believe in that subject, and you know, I believe it. Yeah, yeah, we, we, make the, we make the statement, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Remove that middle part because that middle part is not the issue. God said it. That settles it. That's, that's kind of the end result of all, of all of that. Amy? I wonder how many uh, uh, Benjamin men were missing the, the wives of the killed when they had a midwife. Mm -hmm. And then the kidnapped gals, they were arrested too. Uh, how many battles behind closed doors mm -hmm. there were? Yeah, yeah and, and the writer doesn't give us any of those circumstances, but you're right. That must have been, you know, I've just been kidnapped from my home and my family and made you, made you, I've been made your wife and I'm stuck here. That's, <laughs> sounds to me like it's going to make some very unpleasant households in, in Benjamin. Bill? The answer is you weren't kidnapped, you were caught. Caught, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, just real quickly before we quit with Judges, uh, we started the book and had some considerations and uh, remind you of those again as you, I know you've been thinking about this book because I've had so many people come up and say, what do you think about this? What do you think of, so I think it's, it's really tapped into our curiosity and, and everybody's uh, kind of gotten involved in this, this book and the narrative that we're reading here. And so as you think back over that, as we, we leave this study behind, uh, these are kind of the things we said at the beginning that we should really be thinking about. Number one, partial obedience is not obedience, complete the mission. And that was because Israel didn't conquer the land like they should have. And that's where all these issues arose from because they were polluted by the idols of the nations that were still living right next door to them almost, if we might say that. Uh, learn from your failures. How many judges did we talk about? And they still hadn't learned anything. You know, after the first round, they should have said, wait a minute, what are we doing wrong? Surely after the second round, they should have said, we're doing this again. Let's figure out how to stop it. And they obviously didn't learn from their failures. Uh, and with God, there is no unconquerable enemy. No matter what's going on, if you get God on your side, or let me rephrase that, if you get on God's side, then can you bar the door? Because it's God will take care of it. And Israel didn't seem to be learning that. God can redeem the worst circumstances and decisions. 
And that's what Judges tells us. They, that cycle, they got back around to where they repented and came back to God, and God fixed it, no matter how bad they had been. If they repented, he fixed it. And the same is still true for us today. If we repent, there is forgiveness uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we've got to remember that. Don't assume what you think is right is what God thinks is right. And we've just been talking about that. Don't assume that. Because God doesn't think the way we think. And his ideas are better than our ideas always. And we need to understand that. Uh, judges highlights faith. Uh, the judges themselves who stepped up. Uh, I think of Gideon uh, who you know, cut down the altars of Baal at risk of his own life because that's what he needed to do. And so you, you think of these faithful people. So even in the darkest times, there were faithful highlights that we can hang on to and know that there are people in Israel Again, back to Dave's comment, why didn't somebody raise a hand and say, wait, let's not do this. Maybe there were people who believed that, didn't have the courage to do that or didn't do that or were told to shut up, whatever the case may be. Uh, but we have to remember there were still good people in Israel in spite of all we're reading about in the book of Judges. I think Judges highlights the danger of complacency. And that's what God warned Israel about when they went into the land. You're going to have wells you didn't dig, vineyards you didn't plant, and houses you didn't build. And what's going to happen to you? You're going to get fat, and you're going to get complacent. And that's exactly what Israel did. Judges shows us the worst that can happen. It doesn't seem to be able to get any worse than cutting up a dead woman's body, body in 12 parts and sending it to your neighbors uh, because of what had happened with that. Also, Judges shows us the best of what can happen, of the people who were faithful who stayed with God and came back to God. Uh, Judges makes repentance and redemption a major thing. That's what God wants us to understand. Repentance and redemption. Repentance leads to redemption. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. The blood of his son will, will continue to cleanse us from all sins. That's what John says in 1 John. Uh, Judges demonstrates the need to look beyond ourselves to God for direction in life. Again, everyone was doing what was right in their own sight. They weren't looking to God for direction of what they should be doing. Robin? Did this happen before did this happen before the um, description of touching dead bodies came about? Uh, no, that was the law was already in place by the time all this happened. So Seemingly so. He thought he thought his again, he thought his actions were justified in doing what he did. So, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. That, again, that's the the whole issue. Uh, Judges shows how flawed people can make a difference, and by that we mean I think Samson. Samson did everything right by doing everything wrong. It seems to me. But God can use people like that to make a difference. And so no matter what I've done in my life, whatever uh, mistakes I've made, whatever issues I have, God can still use me uh, to achieve his will. And again, a lot of that goes back to repentance and redemption that we talked about uh, just a few minutes ago. All right? That's it for Judges. Almost. We'll go to the next slide in a minute. But anything else you'd like to say about the books before we, we switch gears? Bill? You know, the sin that took place in that little city led to the death of probably at least a hundred thousand people. Mm -hmm. You got ten percent of the fighting men of Israel were killed. You got twenty five thousand of the Israelite fighters mm -hmm. were killed, plus whomever was in the city, plus whoever was in Jabez Gilead. Mm -hmm. So that one little sin took an incredible number of lives. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's why sin is ugly because its consequences radiate out far beyond just the event itself. Flo? Get the mind and our lives up to God. Secular lives, Christian lives, our work is life. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep a perspective of that. And uh, God will be there for us when mm -hmm. we ask. Him. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. We'll end with this because the first bell has already rung because really the book of Judges isn't over yet. Because when we think about. Come on. There it is. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. That's Ruth chapter 1 and verse 1. 
The entire story and narrative we read about in the book of Ruth occurred during the days of the judges. When, we don't know. We'll talk about that more. Um, what I'd like for us to do is go ahead and look through the book of Ruth again. Not a, an exhaustive study, because back in 2021, during the summer on Wednesday evening, we looked at the book of Ruth and went through it and studied it. And uh, these are basically the same slides used when we did that. Uh, but I want to do this more, not so much for the fact of reminding us about Ruth, which is important and good, but you know the story. Here's the simple thing that I, I want to think about is, if judges left a bad taste in your mouth, Ruth is the breath mint that's going to fix that. That's simple enough. Because it's a story of love and faithfulness and kindness uh, and gentleness in the midst of an awful circumstance that was going on there. And we'll talk more about that as we get into the book of Ruth. And we'll spend a couple of three weeks on, on Ruth and remind ourselves that in the midst of evil darkness, beauty can still exist. And it does. And that's true. And so we have to remember that. And largely because there are still people who are faithful to God and Ruth shows us that faithfulness. Not only Ruth, but, but Naomi and, and all the, the people involved in that particular book show us what life can be like being faithful to God in spite of the darkness that's around us. And so that's where we'll pick up, Lord willing, next with, uh, Sunday morning. Go ahead. I think we owe Kevin a big thank you for all this. Oh, well, you're welcome. I've enjoyed this study. I really have enjoyed preparing for it and, and dealing with it. And uh, I, the only frustration for me is I can't answer all your questions because there are no answers to those questions. But uh, it's, it's, I think it's been a good dialogue and a good study and a good reminder of what happens if we don't do it the way God wants us to. All right, we'll quit there and pick up in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, Lord willing, next Sunday.